Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to topic 3.6.2.1, Nerve Impulses from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. So here's what we've got to know. First of all, we need to know the structure of a myelinated motor neuron. We then need to know how a resting potential is established in terms of differential membrane permeability, electrochemical gradients, and the movement of sodium and potassium ions. We need to know how changes in membrane permeability lead to depolarization and the generation of an action potential, as well as the all or nothing principle. We also need to know how an action potential passes along non-myelinated and myelinated axons, resulting in nerve impulses. We need to know about the nature and importance of the refractory period in producing discrete impulses and in limiting the frequency of impulse transmission. And finally, we need to know some of the factors which affect the speed of conductance, including myelination and saltatory conduction, axon diameter, and temperature. So let's make a start. First of all, we need to know the structure of a myelinated motor neuron. Here on the left, we have the cell body, which contains the most organelles, such as the nucleus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and ribosomes. At the sides of the cell body, we have things which look like tiny fingers called dendrites. Dendrites receive electrical impulses from neighboring neurons. The nucleus is found within the cell body and contains the cell's DNA coding for axon proteins. We have the axon which transfers electrical impulses from the cell body to the synapse. The myelin sheath forms an electrically insulating cover around the axon. It's made of layers of Schwann cells wrapped around each other. And finally, we have synapses, which transmit impulses to neighboring neurons via neurotransmitters. So how is a resting potential established? First of all, three sodium ions are actively transported out of the axon in exchange for two potassium ions via a sodium-potassium pump. The concentration of sodium ions builds up outside the axon as the voltage-gated sodium ion channels are closed, so sodium ions cannot diffuse back. The voltage-gated potassium ion channels are closed. Overall, the outside of the axon is less negative, which can also be phrased as more positive, than inside. This creates a potential difference between inside and outside of the axon. The voltage across the axon membrane is minus 70 millivolts. This potential difference is known as the resting potential. So how is an action potential established? First of all, we have depolarization. A stimulus excites the membrane, resulting in the cell surface membrane of the neuron becoming more permeable to sodium ions. Voltage-gated sodium ion channels open, allowing sodium ions to diffuse into the neuron. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels remain closed. Overall, the inside of the neuron is less negative. The next stage is repolarization. Voltage-gated sodium ion channels close, voltage-gated potassium ion channels open. This allows potassium ions to diffuse out of the neuron, making the inside of the neuron more negative. The voltage decreases back to the normal level. Then we have hyperpolarization. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels are still open for a short time, meaning that too many potassium ions diffuse out of the neuron and the voltage becomes even more negative than the resting potential. Finally, the resting potential is re-established. Voltage-gated potassium ion channels are closed and the sodium-potassium pump restores the resting potential. Here we have it in a table to illustrate the different voltages at each stage and whether sodium and potassium ion channels are open or closed for each stage. At the resting potential, the voltage is minus 70 millivolts and both sodium and potassium ion channels are closed. At the start of depolarization, the voltage is minus 50 millivolts. Sodium ion channels are open and potassium ion channels are closed. At repolarization, the voltage is minus 20 millivolts, the sodium ion channels are closed, and the potassium ion channels are open. Next, we need to consider how an action potential passes along an axon. Note that axons can either be myelinated, meaning that they are surrounded by a myelin sheath, or unmyelinated. The way an action potential passes along an axon is slightly different depending on whether the axon is myelinated or unmyelinated. So let's start off with the passage of an action potential along an unmyelinated axon. 
As one region depolarizes, it acts as a stimulus for the depolarization of the next region. An action potential is therefore a traveling wave of depolarization. In the meantime, the previous region repolarizes. Note that during the refractory period, which is hyperpolarization and after, iron channels cannot be opened, causing a time delay between one action potential and the next. This results in three key features. It means that action potentials don't overlap, there is a time limit to the frequency at which nerve impulses can be transmitted, and action potentials are unidirectional. So next we need to consider how an action potential travels in a myelinated neuron. Myelin sheaths act as electrical insulators, preventing action potentials from occurring. At regular intervals, there are breaks in this insulation, which are called nodes of Ranvier. Action potentials can only occur at these nodes of Ranvier. Therefore, the action potential jumps from one node to the next, which is known as saltatory conduction. This is because localized circuits arise between adjacent nodes of Ranvier. Therefore, the action potential passes along the neuron faster, and less energy from ATP hydrolysis is needed to power the sodium potassium pump. Most neurons, therefore, are myelinated. We also need to know about something called the all or nothing principle. This is the concept that an action potential only happens if the stimulus reaches a threshold value. Action potentials are also always the same size. So how do we therefore detect the size of a stimulus? Well, this can be done in two ways. First of all, by the frequency of impulses. If there is a larger stimulus, there is a higher frequency of impulses. Also, it can be done by having neurons with different threshold values. The brain interprets the number and type of neurons where action potentials are triggered, and so determines its size. Finally, we need to consider factors that affect the speed of impulses. First of all, we have myelination, and we discussed this just now. If a neuron is myelinated, the action potential travels along the neuron at a faster speed due to saltatory conduction. Then we have axon diameter. The greater the axon diameter, the faster the speed of conduction due to less leakage, i.e. return of ions out of the axon. There is less resistance to the flow of ions. Note that this mostly applies to invertebrates who do not have myelination. And finally, temperature also affects the speed of conduction. The higher the temperature, the faster the speed of conduction. This is because ions have more kinetic energy, meaning that there is a faster rate of facilitated diffusion into and out of the axon. Also, there is higher enzyme activity, such as the sodium potassium pump. And yes, the sodium potassium pump is actually an enzyme, hence it often being referred to as an Na plus K plus ATPase enzyme. Great, that would be this part of the specification covered. We've covered the structure of a myelinated motor neuron, how a resting potential is established, and how changes in permeability lead to the depolarization and the generation of an action potential. We've also considered the all or nothing principle. We have covered how action potentials travel along non-myelinated and myelinated axons, resulting in nerve impulses. We have also covered the importance of the refractory period in producing discrete impulses and in limiting the frequency of impulse transmission. And finally, we have considered the factors that affect the speed of conductance. That would be it for now, guys. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment. Next time, we will be covering synaptic transmission.